in my last video, I discussed Jewish wedding ceremonial in the context of a dialogue between the Blessed Virgin Mary and Mary Clopas, wife of Alphaeus, on Holy Saturday, 2000 years ago. And I showed that that dialogue displayed an uncanny knowledge of first century Jewish wedding practice. Well, that wedding practice has significant bearing on a very set of controversial passages in the New Testament, which concern our Lord directly. I shall read from those passages. Mark 13, 24 to 32, but it has parallels in Matthew 24, 29 to 36. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end of heaven. Now learn the parable from the fig tree when its branch has already become tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. Even so, you too, when you see these things happening, recognise that he is near, right at the door. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. But of that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. There are a few controversial aspects to this passage, but we'll deal with this statement where Jesus says of that day or hour no one knows not even the angels in heaven nor the son but the father alone the reason this is in the context of the Olivet Discourse as it's known because it's Jesus speaking to the apostles on the Mount of Olives as they're looking at Jerusalem and Jesus speaks of the future the immediate future and the distant future at the end of time But the key aspects concerning the Jewish marriage ceremony can be recognised from certain things Jesus says. He says that when the believers see these things happening, which will be the appearance of false Christs, ecological disasters, signs in the sky, Recognise that he is near, right at the door. And this is how it was in Jewish marriage ceremonial. I said in my last video, the bride is in her father's house. She's waiting for her groom to come to her house to collect her and take her to his father's house, where he will have created a place for them to live. And so he being right at the door evokes that scenario. Further on, we can note that Jesus says, only the Father, not the Son, only the Father knows the day or the hour. And this is how it was in Jewish marriage procedure. The son is going to get the son has contracted marriage with his bride who remains in her father's her own father's house. The son is in his father's house, and the father determines when the son can go to collect his bride. The father determines when the accommodation is ready. 
to receive the bride who will live in the house of the father with the son. And so even if the son considered it's, he wants to go and get his wife, he can't do so. He must get permission from the father. And so we can say that in first century Jewish life, the young man, because it was common to marry by 20, the rabbis would often disdain a, a family whose son was not married at 20. It could be stretched to 24 in certain circumstances, but that'd be pretty much the upper limit. So the son is under the authority of his father and his father says what goes and when the wife is going to be gone and collected and brought back. The son then can't know when this is going to be until the father tells him. And Jesus is saying, as it is with the earthly image, so it is with the divine reality. Of that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the, not even the angels, well that's taken for granted, but nor the son but the Father alone. One might object, yes, but the analogy isn't complete because Jesus is God, he knows everything. So if you say, if he's saying he doesn't know, then isn't he saying that Catholic doctrine is false? The Council of Nicaea, which says, which says he's of one substance with the Father, is in error and 2,000 years of Catholic teaching before Nicaea and after are false. No one has to look to the Council of Ephesus. We have Nicaea, First Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, Ephesus, sorry, so not Ephesus, Chalcedon, Chalcedon in 451 AD. In Chalcedon you have the dogmatic statement that Jesus is one person with a divine nature and a human nature. He's both fully divine and fully human. The two natures don't mingle. There are two distinct natures in the one person. When Jesus comes to earth, he operates through his human nature. Scripture makes this clear. Saint Luke tells us the boy grew in wisdom and knowledge. And we have instances of Jesus being ignorant. In Mark 5, when the woman with the issue of blood creeps up and touches the hem of his garment and is miraculously cured, it says he feels a power go out of him and he turns round and says, who touched me? This is not a rhetorical statement. He doesn't know at this point. And yet we know, of course, he has supernatural knowledge of all kinds of things. He knows men's hearts. So there's some complex interplay of the divine and human nature. But certainly the basic approach is that he's operating through his human nature. Otherwise he wouldn't be able to operate in a human context. Thus ignorance is perfectly proper to him in his human nature, in his time on earth. It is therefore no surprise that he should say, the son does not know the day or the hour. When I said he has supernatural knowledge of all kinds of things, he set, sets out this end time scenario, as well as a scenario of the destruction of Jerusalem, which will come within the lifetime of the apostles. But the end times would not be within the purview of any human being. He knows it, but he doesn't know the day or the hour. Now we can say there are many, com we call this, a one of, this could be one of the divine mysteries, one might say. Now every religion has divine mysteries. Some poo-poo it. When one says the Trinity ultimately is a mystery, Muslims or Jews will poo-poo this. But in fact, they believe with us that the universe was created from nothing, ex nihilo. There was no pre preliminary matter from which God fashioned the universe. 
Well, we all know we can get something from something. We have no conception of how we can get something from nothing. It is a mystery, but it's a mystery from all those who believe that the universe was created ex nihilo. It's a mystery for Muslims, for Jews. They have mysteries, not the only mystery they have. Well, the operations of God are the mystery. God gives us facts, divine facts, which we can hold on to and say that's true. So that God created the universe from nothing is a divine fact. We don't have to know how it happened, just it's revealed to us that it happened so that Jesus is God and man and operates through his divine nature, so through his human nature on earth and yet has supernatural knowledge is a divine fact. We don't know how, we do not need to know how the divine nature and the human nature interact in Jesus. We'll no doubt find out more of it. As much as our capacity as resurrected human beings who are saved and dwell in heaven with God can know. So there's no great problem there and in fact Saint Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 2 Though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be held onto, to be grasped, but emptied himself. So Christ emptied himself, kenosis. This emptying himself means that he does not hold on to his divine attributes. He does not lose them. You cannot lose your divine attributes, but he's not holding on to them. St. Paul is using the best kind of language we can use when we're speaking of things which are beyond our ken. Jesus is operating at the human level. Thus, the Son does not know the day or the hour when he's on earth before his resurrection. I would argue that after the resurrection, it's a very different matter. He can walk through walls. He can walk through doors. Ordinary matter does not constrain him in any way. His body is no longer a constrained body. Now the body includes the brain. So as he has a resurrection body, he has a resurrection brain. And that will be limitless in its knowledge. And so I would say that after the resurrection, he knows the day and the hour. So if the question had been put to him then, he would say, if he wished, what the day and the hour would be, or he would more likely say, None of your business. The question sometimes arises, where's the Holy Spirit? Does he know the day or the hour? Well, that's where the key to this whole passage being the Jewish wedding ceremonial comes in. If we have an analogy of God the Father to the human father and God the Son to the human son, and the bride being the church, then there's no place for a Holy Spirit in that analogy. It would confuse and distort the comparison. Jesus is trying to evoke in his listeners the Jewish wedding ceremonial, and so he doesn't mention the Holy Spirit. But we can say, we can deduce from Catholic teaching that the Holy Spirit being God, will have no constraints. It is only those with creaturely constraints, that is, the angels, men, and the God-man, Jesus, who is clothed with a creaturely nature. I use the clo word clothed advisedly, not to wish to slip into heresy. But he's, he's operating through his creaturely nature. And only those, that, those in the, the set of creatures are limited in their knowledge, specifically of the day and the hour. This doesn't apply to the Holy Spirit. He has not been incarnated. incarnated. He is not in possession of a creaturely nature. He is fully divine, and therefore he knows the day and the hour. But he's simply not mentioned because it would make a mess of what Jesus is trying to evoke. Jewish wedding ceremonial. So all in all, Mark 13, 32, and its parallel passage, 
in Matthew need have no concern for us. It allows for Jesus to be God, to be um, omniscient. It does not present any problems at all, but it is really a rich way in to an aspect of Jewish culture which we would otherwise miss. There is another controversial piece in this text from St. Mark's Gospel that I quoted, where Julie said, Jesus says, truly I say to you, this generation shall not pass away until all these things take place. And that will form the theme of my third and final video in this little trilogy of videos.